Welcome to CSIS Online. Join us as we bring together top experts and thought leaders to discuss innovative ideas and real-world solutions to global issues, from security and economics to technology and environment. Tune in and be part of the conversation. Thank you for joining us at CSIS for a conversation on a new book by Jeff Kossa. Liar in a Crowded Theater, Freedom of Speech in a World of Misinformation. This book tackles how courts and governments have addressed lies and falsehoods over time, how social media platforms have both democratized the publication of online thoughts, but also found themselves at the, at the center of controversy and ongoing litigation, and ultimately why democracies benefit from allowing reasonable breathing room for free speech. I am really excited to welcome both the author as well as Quinta Jurassic here with me to dive into these topics. Jeff is an associate professor of cybersecurity law at the United States Naval Academy. He is the author of four books and more than 20 academic journal articles. He previously worked as an attorney in private practice, a law clerk for the Ninth Circuit in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, and before becoming a lawyer, he was a journalist for The Oregonian and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and recipient of the George Polk Award for National Reporting. Quinta is a fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. She is also a senior editor at Lawfare, where she was previously the managing editor and is a regular host of several popular podcasts like the Lawfare podcast and Arbiters of Truth. In addition, Quinta is a contributing writer at The Atlantic and The Washington Post's book world. Her writing has appeared in The New York Times, as well as The Washington Post, where she served as an editorial writer. Jeff, I'd like to turn things over to you first to give us an overview of why you chose to write this book and what you hope readers will take away from it. Sure. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. And I just have to give the disclaimer, everything I say is only on my behalf, not on behalf of the DOD, Department of Navy, or Naval Academy. Uh, having that out of the way, um, I wrote this book actually out of a continuation of uh, the debate over the topic of my first book, which was Section 230. And um, I've had countless conversations across the political spectrum with people about Section 230. And um, from a certain group, or from a fairly large group, um, one of the common calls for changing Section 230 was, you know, I don't like this harmful speech, and uh, most often it's misinformation. Uh, misinformation is bad, and Section 230 shouldn't protect platforms from uh, for spreading misinformation. And I would stop and I'd say, well, I mean, unless it's something like defamation, most of what you consider to be misinformation is not going to give rise to a legal claim because we have the First Amendment. We have all sorts of other safeguards. You don't even need to get to Section 230. And I'd usually get different responses like, well, I don't like that. And it's like, OK, well, but then you don't like the First Amendment and you don't like the fact that the First Amendment protects many, but not all false statements. And I really wanted to look at first, why have the courts developed these protections over time? And uh, perhaps the more provocative question is, why is that a good thing? And uh, it's not a terribly popular argument to be making at this point in time. Uh, but I also think it's really important to make that argument and remind people why we don't want to relax our First Amendment protections um, because I, 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 and obviously the First Amendment's not absolute. Um, there are narrow exceptions, but the point is that they are narrow exceptions. And the more that you broaden them, uh, the harder it is to return to the protections we have. So it's really uh, a cautionary tale to really urge people to be very careful about saying, let's turn our back on a century of pretty strong free speech protections. So I'll, I'll dive in with a, a question just to kick off the conversation. Um, a lot of what you're writing about in the book is structured around uh, investigation of the marketplace of ideas theory, which listeners are probably familiar with. Um, this sort of notion that, you know, 
we should have free speech so that we can hash things out and, you know, may the best idea win. Um, and as you write, this proved really central to the development of sort of modern First Amendment jurisprudence in the first half of the 20th century. But I think a lot of the discontent that's maybe manifesting the uh, the people that you're arguing against in this book is a, a sense that the marketplace of ideas perhaps doesn't function as it once did, or maybe never functioned as we imagine that it did. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have the the internet allows a lot more speech and a sort of democratizing of speech but there's also on the other hand so much speech that it can be hard to get your message through at all so i'm curious how you think about the role of the internet social media even these days uh generative ai of course um how they affect this notion of the marketplace of ideas and how that should or shouldn't shape how we think about the role of the first amendment so the marketplace of ideas has never been a perfect metaphor for free speech. It's been one justification that I, I think has many, many benefits um, of how we think about uh, avoiding the immediate impulse to regulate speech. But uh, a, as scholars and judges have pointed out for decades, not everyone has the same access to the marketplace of ideas. So um, someone like Kim Kardashian with who knows how many million followers on social media platforms has a very different access to the marketplace of ideas than the average American. And um, so you're never going to fully counteract false statements with counter speech if, if you don't have that platform. But that's also not the only reason why we, why the courts, why legislatures protect false speech. Um, we have, for example, um, in the advertisement that's right up there um, on my wall. Uh, uh, it was uh, Heed Their Rising Voices ran in the New York Times in 1960, and that was run by, uh, taken out by civil rights groups that were accusing Southern officials of mistreating protesters, which happened. There's no dispute, but unfortunately, the ad also had some errors in it. And um, the New York Times was sued and uh, in a very unfair trial in Alabama State Court, uh, was the uh, local county commissioner received millions of dollar verdict and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court set what's now known as the actual malice standard that uh, for a public official, and it was later extended to public figures uh, to successfully sue and bring a defamation case, they have to show that the defendant either knew the statement was false or recklessly disregarded the falsity, which is a really high standard. And the theory behind that was not um, the marketplace of ideas as much as it was this idea that we need to preserve our ability to self-govern, that democracy depends on this unfettered exchange of ideas. So um that so we're going to set a higher bar even if it means that some falsehoods will inevitably and en enter into the debate because we need to give the breathing space for criticism and investigation of public officials so when it comes to the internet uh, the internet uh, obviously there is a lot of very harmful content on the internet but the internet also contributes both to the marketplace of ideas and to this ability to self-govern by giving both speakers and recipients of speech the agency to communicate more freely. So um, it, it is harder to sort through falsehoods when they're coming at you at this at a ferocious pace. But it's also if you think about um, the ability to at least access information when you compare it to 30 or 40 years ago, I mean, it, it, there, there's just, just so much more of an opportunity. So a lot, a lot of what I do is I, I focus not just on the person who's speaking, but the consumers and what is the experience for them. One really interesting idea that your book raises is that the marketplace of ideas isn't just private actors. It's not just um, people responding to speech that other people make about them. It's also government officials. The government is able to contribute to the marketplace idea of ideas and offer competing viewpoints. We've seen government officials can post information about COVID or elections and government websites. We've also seen officials go on cable TV and release videos on social media to connect with Americans. 
More controversially, we've also seen members of Congress hold hearings with technology executives and point to specific accounts or posts and say, this is an example of disinformation, or even administration officials directly communicate with social media companies with examples of what they see as falsehoods. Some people have called this job owning or informal pressure to moderate content. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how government officials either have or could contribute to this marketplace of ideas without crossing over into this threshold of, of job owning. So I think we'll have a better idea in June when the Supreme Court tells us, um, because right now we have a really terrible guidance that involves like the Rhode Island Commission on Obscenity telling booksellers what they should be able to distribute and a case involving Medicaid from the early 1980s. Um, so we don't really have good guidance. We're starting to see courts come out with guidance. And I think that it's a really tough issue because on one hand you do want the government to be able to respond to what it views as false statements. I think the government's plays an important role. I don't think the government's counter speech is terribly effective if people don't trust the government. And I think that I, I would like to see the government focused more on building trust than telling, uh, th than immediately focusing on telling social media companies uh, not to carry certain speech. But at the same time, the, there are things, and so, some of these things were not even in this Missouri v. Biden lawsuit that's challenged, that's going up to the Supreme Court that I've seen over the years, just statements often from members of Congress um, that I, I, I think does cross the line. So I think that if you're complaining, so I mean, uh, it all goes back to Section 230, but if you're complaining about what you view as health misinformation on the internet, and then in the same breath, you're also complaining, you say, well, they shouldn't have Section 230 protection, and I'm a member of Congress. Um, I mean, obviously, one member of Congress does not have the unilateral authority to take away Section 230, but is that enough of a threat to make it so that this is crossing the line from counter speech to impermissible job owning? And a lot, a lot of that sort of thing, when, when someone with real authority is speaking. I mean, I, I don't want to be in a position where we ever have a system where just an individual speaker can't criticize someone because they're accused of violating their First Amendment rights. That's ridiculous. But when it's the government that has the authority to retaliate and use the force of government to do that, that that's where I think we need to have a clear line. I'm hoping we're going to get that line from the Supreme Court. Uh, my sense is the Supreme Court wants to avoid as many internet issues as possible uh, based on what happened last year with their Section 230 case. But um, I don't think they're going to be able to avoid this because I, I think that it's just there's too too much of a question mark out there right now. Yeah, I mean, if I can chime in, I think what this really brings home for me and Jeff, I'm curious if you agree, is just how much of a sort of moment of flux we're currently in or, or something that could potentially be a, a moment of flux that, you know, we're facing these really profound questions about how much should the government be able to push on these private technology companies that sort of have control over so much of public discourse with, as you say, case law that is just not like really doesn't speak to the issues at hand comes from kind of weird places um is just kind of not up to the task of where we are right now um and so i do feel like that maybe is influencing the the some of the frustrations that you're responding to you know if people are looking at the legal landscape and saying you know what are we supposed to do that there's not a a clear answer one way or the other that doesn't mean that the answer is you know scrap the first amendment and, and start again um but i do wonder whether the courts kind of have a role to play here in uh ideally making the road forward maybe a little clearer um and whether that might be able to help in kind of rebuilding trust as you say which i agree is 
so central to any kind of project of of government response to falsehoods. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think that um, clarity would be the best thing to come out of this. I'm really kind of worried that what we're going to get is like an eight factor balancing test uh, that gives no guidance whatsoever, and and then we're just going to have to find about find out whether it was constitutional after three levels of court review of every time, and, and that's not going to be workable. So I, I, I'm hoping we get some clarity um, where the government really draws the line. And I think that a real danger could be um, in this, as well as some other cases that are coming up this year, I, the, the Supreme Court, starting in 1997, um, took a very hands-off approach to the internet. So the federal government had asked the Supreme Court or, and the federal Congress had passed a law that basically treated the internet like broadcast. Uh, like radio and TV, where you can regulate decency and profanity and public interest. And the Supreme Court very, um, very adamantly said, no, um, we don't do that. The internet is not like a broad, not like broadcast. We don't have scarce spectrum for the internet. Uh, the internet gets the full panoply of First Amendment protections, just like newspapers and book publishers. And I, I worry about a lot of things, so I might just be too worried about this, but I'm worried that this and some of the other cases are giving the Supreme Court an opportunity to rethink that and to say, you know, maybe the government should be more involved in internet content because all it takes is five justices to say, yeah, that, that was 1997, this is different. And I think that could lead to a lot of unintended negative consequences if we basically say that the internet is like radio and TV. I maybe want to pick up on that a little bit, this question of whether social media platforms should be regulated like common carriers, so act more like an open town square for public discourse, no matter how controversial or extreme the various um, posts can be, or whether social media companies should function more like newspapers, like you mentioned, Jeff, um, where they have more control over the information on their platform and they can act more as gatekeepers for information access. Even, even though your book argues in favor of robust speech protections for technology platforms, your book also raises this question of whether this form of power concentration, whether this um, pretty powerful ability to moderate speech is beneficial for society. So what do you think about um, these potential trade-offs? Yeah, so I'm personally a big fan of market solutions. So um, I, I think that, um, let platforms um, set their policies, obviously not to the extent where they would allow illegal constitutional and protected content, but for anything else, I mean, if a platform wants to allow a whole lot of really obnoxious garbage and stuff that borders on spam, let them do that. I mean, let them see if, if that, and if that's what the segment of their users want, that's great. Um, if not, then they, there, there will be a price on the marketplace. And I, I think that obviously the counter argument to that is the whole concept of network effects, that um, you're, you're never going to have a situation where if someone doesn't like one decision a platform makes, they're gonna easily move over to another platform because you have, you've built up followers and friends and so forth. And it's, it, it, it's a much, much more difficult to do that than say, if you don't like what products are being carried at your grocery store. But I think at a certain extent, there will be changes. And I mean, they're my, my favorite cover of a business magazine, it was in 2007 with the um, two founders of MySpace on it. And it was like, will anyone ever stop MySpace? I was like, yeah, <laughs> someone did. And we're seeing the same thing with Facebook. And I, and I, I mean, obviously TikTok has its own unique issues uh, and challenges, but um, I think it is possible. And I, I think that, I mean, we're also seeing kind of a real time experiment in diverging policies when you're comparing Twitter or X to other platforms. And I think that Twitter should has every right to make these changes and maybe it's gonna be a good business decision, maybe it won't be. But um, 
that's better than the government coming in and saying this is what your this is what you must or must not allow on your platform. So speaking of Twitter slash X, you finished editing your book in late 2020. And as we know, the social media landscape looks significantly different now. 2022, yeah. 2022 yeah. yes. <laughs> Um, I'm getting my years mixed up. 2022, yes. So now, as we know, the social media landscape looks very different now compared to just 12 months ago. Most notably, Elon Musk took over Twitter and made a number of content moderation changes, like you mentioned. Um, we've also seen escalating calls from Congress and the Biden administration to ban or divest TikTok, um, at least partially due to concerns over foreign propaganda. So I was wondering if anything has happened in the past year that has either reinforced or potentially even changed some of the, the viewpoints in your book. So my viewpoints have pretty much stayed the same. I think the the big change the the big change that we've kind of alluded to but haven't really talked all that much about is the other big issue the Supreme Court's going to be dealing with, which are the net choice cases involving Florida and Texas laws and. I was able to just get some of the developments into the very final edits of the book, but we've had more developments and that the Supreme Court is, has taken both cases and both Texas and Florida um, impose different restrictions on the ability of platforms to moderate content. And these were driven by the concern primarily from conservative state lawmakers who believe that conservative viewpoints are being disproportionately censored by um, people in Silicon Valley. And uh, the 11th Circuit in Florida, uh, in Florida they uh, found that the Florida law was likely unconstitutional and granted a preliminary injunction. Um, the Fifth Circuit, uh, in a very different ruling, uh, found that the Texas law was likely constitutional. Um, and, and now this is another issue where I'm certain that most of the Supreme Court justices don't want this issue because it's just this awkward issue of do we treat social media companies like telephone companies and other common carriers or do they get, as you were talking about, do they get the full editorial rights as newspapers? And um, I'm hoping to just sort of staying with the general theme of let's get the government out of the internet. So I think in my ideal outcome, and I have no idea if this will be the actual outcome, we would have limits on government job owning and also uh, limits on the government's ability to tell platforms what they can't moderate. So if a platform wants to overly moderate and say, you know, we're not going to allow any, even any discussion about certain topics, they should be able to do that and then face market consequences. Um, I, I think it gets very dangerous if you have the government making these judgment calls, especially when you're dealing with 50 different states. Um, I, I think it gets really unworkable if you have, I mean, only, imagine if the Texas and Florida laws are upheld, I could imagine pretty quickly you have 50 different state content moderation laws. and my bet would be the California moderation law would be different than the Texas moderation law. And then do you have a different internet experience based on where you live? I think that that would be crazy. And um, I, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that it should be the government that's making these decisions. It really should ultimately be the consumer demand. Yeah, one one interesting thing I think about the those net choice cases that are before the Supreme Court is at least the way that I read the court's uh, decision to hear the case, they kind of uh, set aside what, in my view, is maybe the the more difficult part of the question. Um, so the question before the court, the both the Texas and Florida laws had sort of two components, oversimplifying a little bit. There's a component that limits the extent to which platforms can moderate, so requiring them to carry certain kinds of speech. Um, and then there was also a component that imposed a sort of very broad high altitude transparency requirement in terms of what the platform's moderation uh, policies and practices were. And that second part, um, whether that also uh, uh, infringes on the platform's First Amendment rights, I think is, in my view, a much trickier question. 
Um, and the justices uh, going along actually with a suggestion from the Solicitor General, who also filed a brief, um, lopped that off and are only focusing on the question of whether platforms can be required to carry a certain speech. So I think that's interesting. It does suggest, as Jeff, as you say, that you know the justices maybe don't really don't want to touch this and are kind of taking that opportunity to set aside the really hairy part of the question. Um, I also find it interesting insofar as, you know, those sorts of transparency requirements, in my view, um, if, you know, if they can be implemented in a way that doesn't create mass confusion by having 50 different mandates across 50 different states, um, might be a uh, a more workable model of some kind of government intervention than a requirement that you carry or don't carry certain kinds of speech insofar as, you know, we're talking about trust, they allow people to have more insight into how these platforms work, what their policies are, how they're implemented, um, but still allow the platforms to have the freedom to, you know, implement whatever policies they like in the first place. Um, so we we won't know whether or not uh, it's constitutional to impose those requirements. Uh, but I do think it's interesting that both Texas and Florida sort of folded that into their legislation. Yeah, and I, th I think the transparency obligations, I'm kind of uh, mixed on this. I, I don't have a very good idea of what the outcome should be because I, I can understand, you know, maybe this is a compromise. And this, the Florida, the 11th Circuit, while it struck down the moderation restrictions, it did not strike down the transparency restrictions. And I, I see the temptation to say, okay, well, this is a compromise. The platforms have a lot of power. Transparency is good. Um, but then I think about, you know, what about uh, if 30 years ago they required newspapers to uh, post their internal deliberations of the front page meetings. Like the, I, the, there's something that, and then if you say, well, this is different, then what that's suggesting is, well, maybe we don't give the full scope of the First Amendment protections to online platforms. We give sort of some modification. And that's where I get nervous because that's when it starts saying, okay, well then do we, how far do we chip away at their, at their for ability to exercise their First Amendment rights, and um, what else do we impose on them? And that that's where it gets uh, gets a little troublesome. And I also think you're you're right about having fifty different transparency requirements. I mean, we're kind of seeing right now in real time that happen in the privacy landscape as like every week another state passes a massive new privacy law. And the main changes that I'm seeing is the privacy policies are getting even longer than they were before. And it's like, dude, how, how useful is that to the average consumer? You know, earlier we talked about trust. Do you think that transparency could potentially help build trust with individuals, with Americans? Or do you think that the system could potentially go the way of the privacy notices with people just check off the box without reading them. Yeah, so I mean, I think transparency, not just from the platforms, but transparency from the government um, in in terms of countering what it views as misinformation would be, uh, would go a long way. And I, I think that, um, I mean, if you use COVID as a case study, I, I think uh, transparency about uncertainty would, would perhaps have had some more long-term positive effects to say, you know, no, we're not going to say that you'll never get COVID again if you <laughs> have the vaccine because we don't know, but we think that it will reduce the severity or, or we, and there were other governments that were more transparent along those lines and they tended to have more, more public trust in their uh, mitigation efforts because People knew, you know, there wasn't something that the government said two months ago that now has been proven inaccurate. So I, I think um, looking at so so President Obama he gave a speech last year about misinformation, and he said, you know, we focus so much on the supply of misinformation, we don't look at the demand. Why do people buy into misinformation? And I think that's a really important point that. 
you need to, yeah, we can look at the supply, but I, I think there's a lot of dangers and I go through the first half of the book explaining that danger, but why would someone believe that the vaccine has microchips in it? Well, I mean, they might be more likely to believe it because very recently the top officials in the government were telling them that, you know, COVID's not airborne. And there's no way that COVID's airborne, you have to wash your hands forever, and that's how you get rid of COVID, and, uh, or that the vaccine will prevent you from ever getting infected again. So I think that having a bit of humility uh, could really go a long way in addressing, in, in have, having people then accept what you're saying, because you didn't just make a misstatement 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I think there's also, it points to sort of larger... Uh, structural problems in terms of a variety of institutions, frankly, in terms of how they're set up. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, your your points about sort of failures of government communication early and or early in COVID and throughout, honestly, um, are are absolutely right. I completely agree. And I spent a while talking to doctors and other folks in the public health space about, you know, thinking about how to counter misinformation um, over the last few years. And, you know, it's not, I think it's important to bring home, right? Like this is not an abstract concern for people in these spaces. You know, this is like someone comes into the ER and they are dying and they won't let you, you know, intubate them or something like that because they believe such and such will happen to them or they can't be admitted because they refuse to put on a mask because they think that the mask will prevent them from breathing or something like that. Like these are real and really searing and horrifying stories just to sort of bring that home. But I think that for me, what really comes through talking to folks about this is that, you know, um, as you say, Jeff, it, you know, why do people believe these things? It's because they may not trust federal public health officials because they heard something different the month before, right? I mean, I always think when we talk about platforms moderating health misinformation, like the go-to example is in, I think, mid-March 2020, when the Surgeon General and the WHO were saying, you don't need to wear a mask. And then a month later, everyone was supposed to wear a mask. And of course, everyone was figuring out what was going on. There were reasons that they they said that because they wanted to preserve uh, personal protective equipment for medical workers. But at the same time, that obviously breeds confusion and mistrust. The there and then there's this kind of additional structural element where you know, um, I'll just speak to the to the U.S. context. You know, if people let's say you're in a rural community. Um, you don't have access to a ton of doctors. There's, you know, a local doctor or a couple local doctors who you've gone to your entire life. Um, and they tell you, you know, the vaccine is going to hurt you or the vaccine is going to cause a heart defect or even something absurd, like it's going to magnetize you, none of, none of which are true, to be clear. Um, but, you know, if that's a person you've known your entire life, you've spent your life going to their practice, you've taken their kids there, why wouldn't you trust them more than, you know, some bureaucrat who, you, who you've never met who's on television? And I say this not to be, you know, condescending, but because I think it really speaks to the ways that people interact with, in this instance, the healthcare system and who they trust and why they trust. Um, and it underlines just how difficult a problem this is to fix. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Jeff, that, you know, this, this is in large part a demand problem. Um, but the pro the difficulty with with addressing the demand problem is that it really requires you to dig very deep down into all kinds of like really difficult societal problems to address that. And I mean, I'm talking about COVID here, but I think we could have the same conversation about election misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's difficult for platforms to decide how to handle that because a significant part of the American population believes that the 2020 election was stolen. And why do they believe that is a really complicated issue. There are smart political scientists working on this question and they don't know the answer either and the question of how to untangle that is tough and i do think that sometimes you know politicians uh when they sort of take action in in the form of job owning there's a sort of instinct of you know the platforms are kind of the lever that seems like it's available to pull um you know if we just tell platforms 
no health misinformation or you lose 230 protections, which is a, a very bad bill that <laughs> Jeff points out in his book that thankfully hasn't gone anywhere. Or, you know, something similar regarding election misinformation that seems like an attractive way to kind of fix the problem by pushing it off to the platforms and making them fix it. But ultimately, it doesn't actually address any of the underlying issues, which are incredibly complicated and very, very difficult difficult to bore down into. Well, and I also think, I fully agree, and I also think that those proposals um, actually could have the unintended effect of having drawing more attention to the misinformation. It's kind of like so much goes back to the Streisand effect. Uh, so the Streisand effect, which Mike Masnick coined probably 20 years ago, um, which is, was Barbara Streisand basically suing someone for publishing a photograph of her home and it drew more far more attention to to the photograph than had ever been on it before her lawsuit i feel like that concept can also be applied to misinformation in general which is um if you're saying like um uh, the governor of washington state jay Inslee, did last year that we need to pass a law that says if a politician or a political candidate says that our elections are uh, not administered correctly, and there's been an official declaration of a victory um, that they can go to jail for a year. Like that, I mean, first off, that's so blatantly unconstitutional. But even if it was not, you would think, well, how would this work in practice? So, like, some someone who's running for a local office says, you know, I don't, th I, I think the county clerk was biased against me. So, something like that. It might not even be a very viable claim, but. Um, do they think that arresting and prosecuting that person is going to make fewer people believe that their claim is true? Like, it, it, it's just, it's so incredibly short-sighted. And the same thing for the Klobuchar misinformation bill, which is, uh, a a as you were saying, is basically saying, you know, it gives, uh, it says that during a public health crisis, um, if a platform algorithmically amplifies any health misinformation, it loses 230 protection for that content. And then you look at, well, what's the definition of health misinformation? And it says, oh, the HHS secretary determines that in guidance. And it's like, I, I mean, this isn't serious. The, like to say that you're going to give one bureaucrat who very well may have no expertise in the issue or might, but to give them the unilateral authority to determine what speech has more liability than others like that's i i don't see that how that even helps the problem uh because and i don't see how it builds faith in the information that the government's putting out if they're doing this sort of thing right and i think covid and health misinformation is a really good example of a case where um, the scientific understanding isn't always, there's not always a consensus or our understanding can change over time. Um, just like with our understanding of masks in March 2020, um, sometimes social media companies or governments or newspapers must act based on either a very limited or evolving understandings of what the facts are. Um, so I was wondering how these entities can reach content decisions in this case. Like, is there anything that social media content moderation moderators do to retroactively address past content decisions? If new information comes to light, do you think that they've made the correct choices in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think that changing your policies acknowledge, and I, I think that um, one important part is that there's, in, in the more controversial cases, um, there's not going to be one single right decision because um, there there might there probably will be some people for a lot of these decisions who say no, you should have left it up. Others who say you should have taken it down. Um, so a lot of these, there's even with more information, you're not going to suddenly say, oh, they, this was this clearly should have been taken down or left up. Um, so I think providing more explanation as, and lear, learning from, from that mistake. I mean, I think that one thing that um, is often lost in the debate about content moderation is that so much of what's actually not, what, what's blocked from actually re reaching user screens, which is a lot, 
is not anything that would be controversial. Um, I mean, like beheading videos, child sex abuse material, like nobody would say, oh, that was a tough call. Obviously you like report it to the authorities and uh, that that's no, no one saying, you know, there, that would be a ridiculous argument to say there was a first amendment right to that. Um, but then there's stuff like spam, which I mean, I, I don't think that most people are really worked up about the first amendment rights of spammers and, but, but then you get to more political content. And I think that's where the really legitimate debates are. But I just think that it's often that, that there's this misconception that all content moderation are these really difficult political <laughs> issues when most of it is stuff that I don't think anyone would really argue should stay up. And you mentioned that um, criminal penalties for speech can have potentially detrimental consequences for Americans. Your book also discusses other potential approaches, and that includes defamation litigation, for example, in a very high profile case of Dominion v. Fox, um, and then professional discipline, which could include bar discipline um, for attorneys, for example. Um, so what are your thoughts on those approaches to addressing the potential of the yeah, so I mean, as a former journalist and media lawyer, I'm never eager to say, oh, defamation lawsuits are great. Um, and that's in part because they're really awful on both sides. Like no, nobody's ever really excited to be either a plaintiff or a defendant in a defamation lawsuit. Um, they're costly. The discovery is particularly awful um, for, for plaintiffs and defendants. And so, I think that defamation often for the, depending on what you conceive of misinformation, it's often not going to be a solution in part because it's focused on harm to a particular individual or company. It's not just sort of general social harm, um, but there are certain cases where it can be useful. And I think Dominion was one of them where Dominion was meeting all of the high bars. We, we won't know for sure in the Fox case, if it would have met, actual malice, my guess is that the jury would have found that, uh, that Fox acted with actual malice because the evidence was just like the worst nightmare for any media lawyer. Like to, it, it was just like mounds of actual malice. Like, so, so I, I think they probably, so I think that probably is what drove the $787 million settlement on the eve of trial. Um, but that was a case where, you know, yeah, the bar for defamation is very high in the United States. It's fortunately much higher than it is in the UK, and it gives that breathing space. But I think the Dominion case is a good example where it doesn't give unlimited breathing space. And there are certain limits, uh, even in US defamation law. And I think um, Fox showed that. And I think we're going to see other Dominion and Smartmatic cases where where I, I wouldn't be surprised to see similar outcomes. Um, in terms of other, I mean, there, there's a lot of narrowly defined areas where, you know, you'll face consequences for a falsehood. So if you go to court and you lie in court, that's perjury. And like, you can't do that and you will face consequences. Um, you can't lie to a federal agent. Um, if, if you're an attorney and you lie in court, you face professional, you can face professional consequences. If you're selling a product and you make a false claim, you're not about the product's efficacy. You're not going to get the full scope of the First Amendment protections that a newspaper would receive. But um, so so I sometimes I've been asked over the past month as I've been promoting the book, like, you know, and been told I'm a free speech absolutist, which is ridiculous because if I were an absolutist, I'd say, you know, I none of this should lead to liability. And I mean, other than Justice Hugo Black, who's been dead for a while and nobody agrees with him, I don't think anyone seriously thinks that the First Amendment's absolute. But what I wrote the book to do is to urge people to stick to the, the narrowly defined exceptions to the First Amendment recognizing that there can be other exceptions that the court hasn't confronted. It has said that, but 
to set a very high bar for that. And I mean, getting to the title of the book, the reason why I linked it to Fire in a Crowded Theater is that time and time again, th this actually was a title that I, that I came to about halfway through writing the book. Um, because in almost every case where someone was trying to justify a speech restriction that ended up getting struck down on First Amendment grounds, they, the party, the government or the plaintiff would say, well, just like you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, you also can't say this. And almost always you could say this. Um, and so I urge against sort of this fire in a crowded theater trend of saying, waving the wand and saying, you know, this is bad speech. We don't like it. So therefore we're going to create an exception. What I'm trying to do is say, let's not do that. Let's there, there always is a role for regulation or liability for these narrow categories, but let's not just say we're going to create this huge new category of everything we don't like, because that soon enough, that's going to be everything someone else doesn't like, but you might like. And I, I kind of urge people to think about how that would operate. Yeah, I mean, it's funny as I'm as I'm sitting here, I'm looking at a, a photograph on my wall of a newspaper article about a distant relative who was arrested and prosecuted under the Espionage Act in 1917 for distributing anti-draft literature. So there, there's a great example of what the fire in a crowded theater test will get you. Um, but in in all seriousness, um, I do think I mean, so to, to your points about the Dominion litigation, I think this is a it's a fascinating trend. Um, and the Dominion is really just one of many suits, the Dominion v. Fox. So Dominion itself has filed a number of different cases, Smartmatic, the other uh, voting machine company that was the subject of falsehoods around the 2020 election. Um, they have also filed a number of lawsuits. There is litigation um, on behalf of election workers, uh, postal workers, a number of different private individuals who were the subject of falsehoods that were spread by the Trump campaign and people affiliated with that campaign, you know, uh, alleging that they were involved in efforts to seal the election or things like that. Um, so among among the folks suing are uh, uh, Shay Moss and Ruby Freeman, the uh, daughter and mother election workers in, in Georgia who testified before the January 6th committee who uh, have sued uh, One American News, which they they settled that lawsuit, um, and uh, Rudy Giuliani as well. So this is really a kind of burgeoning trend. And I do think that, you know, the Dominion, as you say, if you read the filings in the Dominion case, it's like a what not to do in terms of of uh, actual malice. It's really striking. And I think that, to me at least, that kind of shows how powerful these cases are because they're so extreme. Um, and I'll draw here on a point uh, that uh, uh, Rennell Anderson Jones, who's a law professor at the University of Utah, made to me that, you know, there is, as you write in your book, Jeff, a kind of a movement um, on the right to overturn Sullivan. And uh, Professor Anderson Jones's point was, you know, if you like the Sullivan standard, you can look at these cases and say, these are actually, these show that Sullivan can work because it's not that Sullivan gives a free pass to the press. There are these incredibly extreme cases where you can actually meet that actual malice standard. Um, again, obviously the Dominion v. Fox case settled, um, but I do think that it will be really interesting to watch where these lawsuits go going forward. Um, and also to watch, you know, uh, whether they overstep, right? Um, so far, I think the plaintiffs' lawyers who have been bringing these cases have been pretty careful, at least as far as I can tell, in really picking the most egregious possible cases, you know, instances in which uh, a falsehood was was told repeatedly, the person was told that it was false, they kept doing it anyway, again and again and again and again. Um, and I completely agree, you know, there's a real risk if you start using defamation law in this way that it could be, you know, turn things around. You can imagine, uh, you know, Donald Trump or someone who is in his camp trying to bring a lawsuit against, you know, the New York Times or something like that. Um, and so it will be really important to watch if courts are able to kind of uh, make clear exactly where that boundary line is, um, which so far we I don't think we've seen any slippage. Um, so I'm sort of comfortable with where things are, but it's definitely worth worth keeping an eye on. 
Um, and then, Caitlin, to your point about professional discipline, um, so this is something I've been watching pretty closely, and I find it very interesting, both in law and in medicine, actually. So in the in the legal space, Steph, you read in your book about the uh, bar discipline against Rudy Giuliani. So Rudy's, uh, his law license in New York is currently suspended with an ongoing investigation. Um, he is facing uh, ethics charges in D.C. now. He's one of many of the lawyers who are involved in efforts to overturn the election who are facing ethics charges. Um, you also see in the medical space efforts by state medical boards and private certifying boards to discipline doctors who are, you know, telling their patients not to get the vaccine because it will put microchips in their blood, that kind of thing. And I think these examples are interesting because they go exactly to what Jeff is talking about in terms of, you know, there are these areas in law that are sort of carved out as somewhat distinct from the more sort of anything goes spirit of conversation online. I apologize for the siren. Um, that there, you know, there are spaces where the, the law does allow for a certain amount of professional discipline. It allows for state medical boards to set standards. It allows judges to enforce discipline in a courtroom, um, which is why, you know, Donald Trump can be under a gag order in the New York civil trial, for example. And so sort of pushing down in those areas and responding to potentially harmful falsehoods is a way of responding without necessarily eating away at First Amendment protections outside those spaces. Um, and then, of course, the question is, you know, OK, how, how much can that do? Right. Um, because these are, by definition, relatively narrow spaces. Um, you don't want a judge to be able to say, you know, no lawyer can talk about this case on TV, even if they have no relationship to the case, just to make up a extreme scenario. Um, and that, I think, is kind of a question that we'll see over time. In my view, I think the real power here is in deterrence, um, essentially, you know, signaling to to point to, you know, the Rudy Giuliani example, if you are a lawyer who's out there thinking, hey, maybe I want to try to, you know, overturn the 2024 election, if you're really thinking ahead, um, look at what happened to Rudy Giuliani, look at what's happening to John Eastman, to Jeffrey Clark, who are also facing ethics charges. Maybe I don't want to touch that. Um, and, and sort of holding back from that. And then the question is, you know, to what extent does that deterrence have a broader ripple effect? And that, I think, is a really big question and something that we we don't know the answer to. I do wonder, just, you know, speaking about election misinformation, as we get closer to 2024, speaking about COVID um, and other health misinformation, I think it's kind of a running question. But I do wonder, as we see these institutions kind of try to uh, figure out the right balance for how to assert that authority without overstepping and raising First Amendment concerns, um, that it might be kind of an interesting natural experiment to see what level of effect that has. I'm also interested. So we are a public policy think tank, so I feel like I need to ask a public policy question. <laughs> Jeff, your book mostly focuses on free speech in the United States, but you do hint at the fact that not every country has the same both legal and cultural standards um, that we have in the United States in terms of the First Amendment. Um, it's really interesting. Um, you mentioned that depending on the outcome of the net choice case, we could potentially have 50 different content moderation policies. But many social media platforms are facing this because they operate not only in the United States, but around the world, where we're seeing numerous content moderation laws and regulation emerge, um, whether those are fake news laws or laws targeted towards illegal content or harmful content or child safety. Some of these laws require platforms to either take down or keep up certain types of content. Others promote algorithmic transparency, for example, or user control. So I was just wondering, is this something that you're following? And are there any lessons that maybe the United States could take away from other countries' experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that probably the, uh, obviously we have, I mean, authoritarian laws like in Russia, where you can go to prison if you say what's happening happening in Ukraine is a war or invasion. But I, I think probably the more realistic sort of slip, slippery slope that we're seeing is in Europe right now. Um, this law of the Digital Services Act recently went into effect. And I 
if I had about eight hours, I would go through exactly how it works, but it's a very complex law and I've been concerned about it for a while and I've been assured over many months, if not years, you know, this is just procedural and it's just setting rules of the road for platforms, but it has a variety of different requirements, including a lot of procedures for disinformation and hate speech. And what you saw, I went into effect, I think in August, soon after you saw this guy, um, I, I won't even say his name, but he's the European commissioner who supervises the sort of commerce. And he, on an almost daily basis, I won't say daily because that might be misinformation and they might send me to prison, but um, on a very frequent basis, he puts out on Twitter and I don't know if he uses other platforms, kind of this demand that he's seeing disinformation or hate speech and he he's sending his enforcement teams and there's always like a selfie of himself it's really like a weird it, it's a very bizarre thing but it, i mean it, it's scary that you've got this one unelected bureaucrat who's like i i know what's right for the internet and this is my vision for it and i i think that probably within the next year we'll see what impact this has on the internet because it's I mean, the, the fines under the DSA go up to 6% of annual turnover, which is globally. So, I mean, that's like existential amounts of money for a lot of these companies. So um, I, I think that's probably the biggest experiment that we're seeing in sort of an abrogation of online speech rights. Now, do you think that um, do you think that there's anything in any of the proposed bills or any of the laws that we've seen emerge around the world that could potentially help? I, I mean, in terms of regulating speech, no, I, I don't. I, I mean, I, I don't haven't seen any that are like, oh, that's the speech that needs to be regulated because. I, I worry that it, it's not just going to stop there. I think using existing tools beyond regulation is more effective. And I think that um, one example I use in the book is Finland, that they've started uh, in the primary grades going all the, all the way through college. They have media literacy as part of their educational system, not telling people what is right and what is wrong, but instead telling people, you know, if you see something on the internet, how do you, what are some methods to at least assess its veracity before automatically accepting it? And uh, I have a nine-year-old and at least to date, she's never had any education along those lines. I wish that they would do that at school. Um, I think that's a much more productive way. It, it's harder. It's not this panacea. It's not like immediately people are going to be cured of misinformation, but I, I think that that's a long-term way of reducing the impact of online falsehoods. I think uh, I use the example of Denmark and uh, throughout COVID, they were very blunt. Their leaders were very blunt and honest about what they didn't know. I think those sorts of approaches, I'd like to see a lot more of. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and something that you raise in your book. It's not just the responsibility of the social media companies to either take down or remove or label harmful content, but there's also a role for how viewers, how users respond to the online messages we see, whether those are conspiracy theories or spam or anything else. Um, your book does describe how falsehoods or misinformation isn't a standalone challenge. It's not only a technological issue, but it's often a reflection of broader societal issues. You mentioned media literacy, but this could also include other issues like economic inequality, mental health, civic education as a whole. Um, so what, what, what do you think are some potential non-technical solutions that um, could potentially address how society reacts to or responds to some of the potentially harmful content that they see on? Well, so I think all of those are really the non-technical side. So things like ed education, um, I do think uh, you alluded to this, but I go through, I have a chapter that goes through the way that two DC district court judges sentenced two very pretty low level December or January 6th defendants. And one of them said, you know, you're just kind of the victim of misinformation. You're this pawn in this game. And the other said, 
no, that's not an excuse. No matter who is telling you this, you have a responsibility. And I do, I, it maybe be, it might be a little heartless, but I'm saying, I, I do think that the latter approach of saying, you know, if you're going to buy into this and react to it in a certain way, then you will be responsible for the consequences. And I think that as a society, we should have that view and not just view people as these passive recipients who will just automatically believe everything, that they have agency. And they do need to be held accountable if, if, they, call, if, there's, if they react in a certain way and it's illegal. Yeah, I found those those examples with regarding sentencing really thought provoking, especially because, you know, going back to the point I was making earlier about deterrence. Um, I think that there's there's a question here of, you know, whether these sentences and showing that people can and will be sentenced uh, to, you know, a significant amount of time in prison for taking actions, even if they were led to take those actions by falsehoods that they believed. Uh, could potentially down the road really prevent people from taking, you know, trying to uh, carry out an insurrection in the future um, and hopefully potentially other sorts of uh, actions like that. There's sort of no way to know um, until we see whether it does or doesn't happen. Um, but I do think that that your point there about sort of the role of the criminal law was really interesting. So I think that's all the time that we have. I want to thank everybody online for joining us here today at CSIS. A special thank you to Jeff and Quinta. You've both left us all with some food for thought. This video will be available on the CSIS website and YouTube channel. And Jeff's book is now available, I believe, both in bookstores and online. I actually have my copy right here. Um, so I definitely recommend that everybody give it a read.